here tonight for our presentation on the history of the Central Mass Railroad, which is a very dear topic for me because my grandfather, Harold uh, Judkins, also known as Judd, was a railroad enthusiast and historian. He lived to be 97, has passed away for many, many years, but I grew up with all of the stories and the history of the, of the train. So it's a real honor and pleasure to have Alan LePayne here uh, present us with his presentation. Before we begin, though, I'd like to give a little update on some of the other activities and events that the Rutland Historical Society is, is going to be having. I received a, a call from Bob Locke from Rutland. He was a former school mate of mine, and he works for the Wachusett Greenways and the rail trail. And so he contacted me and asked several months ago if the, if the Historical Society would be interested in combining a rail hike as a tribute to the history of the trains and the train wreck that happened in 1932. And I said, well, funny, we have Alan LePayne coming on September 17th. So Alan is going to join us this Saturday, and you are more than welcome to come and join us at 10 Miles Road near the future site of the Wachusett Greenways Visitor Center. And we are going to take a hike um, along the rail trail. Uh, we'll be learning about the Rutland Station, um, Molten Pond, which is now Cotton's Pond. Um, and we also have someone from Greenways who's also going to be, um, who's a, in the Audubon Society, and she will also be giving us some information about the different nature and plants that are along the, the <coughs> railroad or the rail trail. So it's at 9 o'clock. We hope you can make it and just wear comfortable sneakers, and it's going to be a short little hike, but worthwhile. So I'm proud that, that this is happening. My grandfather would be thrilled. <laughs> he used to make a little marker and put it down um, where the train wreck was and before even the rail trail was ever established, so anyway. What address was that, Sheila, again? Um, 10 Miles Road. Better write down, uh, I gotta show up. What's that? 21. Oh, 21, thank you, I thought it was 10. All thank right. Thank you for that clarification. And what time? The wrong house. 10 is at the top of the hill, 21 is down at the curb. Okay, right at the curb and that's where there's parking. And park on the lawn. Okay. Of the house. Great, thank you. I'd also like to introduce our select board member, uh, Jeff Stillings, where he also is hosting a final project, uh, something that he's been working on with the Scouts, and that's going to be in back of the Historical Society House, the Wood House, on Saturday, I mean Sunday, Sunday. Yep. September 29th. Yep, so, thank you, Sheila. Mm -hmm. So uh, approximately two minutes and 45 seconds ago, Sheila came up to me in the back and says, I'm going to call you up and uh, have you talk about what you're doing on September 29th. Uh, you can say a few things. So if I sound like I'm not prepared or a little unprepared, it's because I am not. So, um, we have, we have been working on a project with the Scouts and the Historical Society as it comes to uh, perambulation, which is an old law that that dates back into the uh, 1800s, perhaps the 1700s. It's the witnessing of the town cornerstones. It's an agreement between your bordering towns on where one line begins and one line ends. And it's an old uh, common law that says every five years, the select board or their designees are to witness the cornerstones, put their mark on it. So if you go to town lines, you'll see a funny looking stone and you'll see it painted with the year on there. That's what that is, and we found that there's 36, through the records, 36 cornerstones that make up Rutland. So, uh, 2019 was the time to do the five-year perambulation, and uh, as a the junior member of the select board, I, I threw the short straw to, uh, and, uh, and, a glass, to do it. Yeah. And we decided that this would be a great project to do with the scouts. 
and it kind of evolved from there. So I met with the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the Wolf Scouts, and I realized that there's several troops in town, there's several different versions of the Scouts, and uh, see who was interested, and many of them came forward. So basically, we were able to uh, have six different Scout units for the six different borders that our town uh, separates, and to assign them certain stones to go out and find them. Yep. Number before it's in the reporting had like latitude and longitude been recorded or any photos or anything to be a little bit more exact on where they are. But we encouraged the scouts to say this is a lot more than finding a stone and painting the year 2019. It's whatever you want to make of it as is life. Um, so we try to take things to the next level and there were a couple of other spin-offs that we did this year, this season, with the Historical Society and the Scouts. The first being uh, the Moses Howe Memorial. During the process, we identified one of the town heroes, a founding member, who was a perambulator who witnessed the, uh, the town stones. He was a selectman, he was also a constable. And uh, with that information, we're like, well, this is the first law enforcement officer that Rutland has seen. And coinciding with National Peace Officer Memorial Day on May 15th, we did a nice wreath laying up at the old burial grounds here, uh, recognizing his name was Moses Howe, and he was a uh, founding father of, of this town. So that was the first part of this perambulation project. The scouts were an active participant of it. Sheila gave a little history of Moses uh, and 1733 Rutland. We had Dan Suhaki come in and talk a little bit about the, uh, the life pre-revolution, uh, the Indian raids and, and whatnot. Uh, they did a musket salute. That was, it was very nice. So that was one part. Hmm. Second part was a time capsule. We invited the scouts, uh, ages 7 to 14, to write letters to themselves uh, 50 years from now. So they all wrote a letter. And we also reached out to the Council on Aging and the Historical Society for anybody who wanted to write a letter down to their descendants to be opened uh, 50 years from now. And we got bags full of that. So uh, there was a time capsule which jam-packed with letters, which I believe is the most priceless artifact in there. There are also some different uh, trinkets in there. The DPW gave us a uh, airtight sewer pipe that's good enough for the sewer. That's going to be good enough for the sewer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a time capsule. It's airtight. Uh, Sheila and uh, the members of the Historical Society were kind enough to give us a piece of property in the rear of the Historical Society beyond uh, two other <coughs> stones. One's for a little red schoolhouse, and the other one was for the Rutland. Well, it was a quarter store of some sort. So this was the triangular where we put it in there, and it's going to be in the final town report um, of October 7th on where it is buried, how deep it's buried, uh, what is in there, and why, uh, based on what, what people were giving and what we tabulated in there. So the final piece of this project is we needed a corner marker. We actually didn't have a marker to put in the back of the historical society or what is there. Uh, so people know that there's a time capsule there. So a uh, childhood friend of mine, Henry Stitson from Paxson, Stitson Stone, he's donating his time and materials. He's going to come out here with a big, large piece of granite. And on the 29th, the last Sunday of this month, at noon, behind the historical society, he's going to teach the scouts how to cut stone. We're going to decide on, on what a marker should be. And you'll find of the 36 stones, no two are alike. So uh, we let the scouts decide. And during the process, we actually sworn them in or commissioned them in as assistant perambulators. So town officials in there. And they take, they've taken their job very, very seriously. So they will decide on what a, a proper marker should be in the back of your historical society in there. And I'm sure it will look very much like a uh, one of the normal cornerstones that you see entering the town. And he's also going to teach us how they engrave a stone. And most of the stones would be are for Rutland or the bordering town would be on the other side. So OK and you'd see it all on there. And we'll do 2019 for the year that it was uh, encapsulated. And then probably something to reflect 2069 that this needs to be opened 50 years from now. So anybody who's still around in the year 2069, if you, if you happen to remember, if you happen to remember, there is a time capsule back there. What time? What time? Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a noon, yeah? Oh, okay. No, it's always a noon. Rain or shine. Rain or shine. Uh, yeah, and I'll be bringing the hot dogs. I'll be cooking hot dogs on Sunday again. 
And uh, so, yeah, if you happen to remember, that's the importance of that. It will be in the archives and the records. And, uh, but thank you for Thank you for, uh, for doing the job. Well done. In October, on the 19th, we are going to be having our fall, the fall festival of the Forgotten Arts and Farmer's Market. It takes place on the common in front of the churches. It's from 9 to 2. We have a lot of new vendors coming this year, as well as we're returning the pumpkin carving, as well as scarecrow making. So we hope you can attend and, and enjoy that day. And then our most popular event, the Festival, Fall, uh, the Festival of Trees, will be held December 6th, 7th, and 8th. And more information will be forthcoming on that. Again, thank you so much for coming this evening. And without further ado, Alan will say thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Well, again, thank you coming, for coming to my presentation here. My name is Alan LePayne, and I reside in Holden with my family and my lovely wife, Kathy, over there. And uh, thank you for letting me come in and entertain you for an hour or so. And if I'm going too long, you guys can wave me and tell me to, you know, cut it off. And, but I have probably way more material than we do have time tonight. So I kind of limited the, our time from... Oakdale to Gilbertville. If we make it, we might just get up through West Rutland uh, with the time allotted. So I'll take it one step at a time and we'll see where it goes. So I am a member of the Boston and Maine Railroad Historic Society along with a few other members here. It was about 15 years ago that Rick Connard, sitting in the second row, gave the first overview of the Central Mass and its history way back at a Watchers of Greenways meeting. And I actually still have a VH tape, VHS tape of that meeting because it was on public television for a little while and I says, I gotta record this thing. But of course, I don't have a VHS player so I couldn't watch it if I wanted to. I'd have to have it converted. But, because um, Rick gave a, a wonderful uh, overview of the railroad that day. So my speech today is actually gonna be a little bit different. I will give you the history uh, how the railroad passed through the towns here. But in addition to just information and historical facts, which there are uh, books on that topic, and there are others that give presentations that kind of outline facts and things like that, I want to give the, fo the photos plus the stories behind the photos. So thanks to Harold Judkins, I have a lot of these things. Because Harold, through the years, had a little notebook that he kept in his pocket, and he would go around to different people that worked on the railroad and jotted down notes. And he took a number of photos, and he grew up in the reformatory branch and was one of those lucky kids that got a chance to not only ride in a steam engine, but he actually was allowed to drive it. So that's always a dream for every little boy. I've had one ride in a cab, and it's, I cherish it to this day. But uh, now, uh, just to keep going here, we got one little glitch. My little remote won't work with the settings, so I have to keep turning around. So don't be offended if I keep doing that. If you want to know more about the Central Mass, there's a couple of great books out. The first one was by J.R. Green. It's no longer in print. And it goes to the original history of how this all got started. And he goes into all the politics and all the issues and all the problems and the finances. And it's quite interesting to see how this all got started. And also the Central Mass book was put together. Harold was one of the contributors. And I believe Rick Connor was also one of the contributors. And we put together the history of the railroad. Right there, that photo is out at Clinton Dam. The train is coming. It's been crossed over the trestle. It's past the dam, and it's now going around to the causeway heading toward Clinton Junction. And there's nothing left, pretty much, of the railroad these days. But if you see that signal right there, the concrete base and actually the, the footing for the ladder that went up the post is actually still there today. So you can see that. So how many of you here today have enjoyed the uh, walking or biking the rail trails at the, as part of the Watchers at Rail Trails? I know Ed has to raise his hands. He's been intimately involved with that. And, uh, you know, as you walk the rail trail and you see a few little sights, the most common thing you'll probably stumble on is a little piece of coal that might be off on the side. And once in a while, uh, you might find a rail spike or even a tie plate. And uh, so my boys, uh, as we walked all the different sections here, we have a 
a mound of rail spikes at home because they had to collect these things. And I found some other really interesting uh, pieces along the way, including one, it's a, it's a clinker bar is what they call it. It's about 11 feet long, it's one and a quarter diameter made of cork 10 steel, and it probably weighs about 100 pounds. And this thing was sticking out of the ground one day, and it has a loop on the end that actually the fireman or the uh, yeah fireman actually held to get into the firebox to break up quote the clinkers because what you didn't want to happen in a steam locomotive was to have that pile of coal just solidify right there. So they would break it up. They wanted to keep the bed of coals even so that it produced the most amount of energy and that the coals fully burned up and they got efficiency that way because conserving coal was a big thing for the Boston and Maine and for engineering crews. And uh, we'll talk about coal being an issue even here in Rutland. So many of the sights and the sounds, including the smells, that were once an active railroad line from the steel tracks to all the various structures have long ago vanished. So it's nearly impossible for us today to know about what things looked like as a railroad passed through its journey from Boston to Northampton, Mass. So the Central Mass was the Boston and Maine Railroad's longest branch. It was 100, approximately 104 miles long and uh, passed through our towns. And back in the days of railroad fever, that was an important deal. Every town wanted to be involved. So I'm going to start off with a trivia question. So for the railroad buffs, I don't want them to answer this. And if you would, raise your hands and not just blurt out the answers. Oh, wait a minute, no kids here, right? Oh, we got a hand already. So what important 150th anniversary in railroad history happened in May of 2019? And there's more to the story. I see a hand way back there. The Golden Spike in Ogden, Utah. There you go. So it was 150 years ago in May that uh, the uh, Union Pacific and the Central Pacific had their first transcontinental railroad line that was joined in, in uh, Utah there. And we have photos of it. And one of the things that they did, there's three things that happened on that day. Not only was that main event happened, they also had telegraph lines. And what they did was, so this was May 10th. For the first time, the telegraph was used to flash the news across the nation with three signals, or I should say three dots, followed by the message, done. And that was literally from the West Coast to the East Coast to Washington, and the whole nation was able to celebrate that day, the joining from end to end of our nation, which was a big feat in those days. So the second thing was, on the same day, a bill was passed by the Massachusetts legislature chartering a new East-West Railroad to run from Boston to Northampton, Mass, as a Massachusetts Central Railroad happened on the same day. So the legislature must have been in a real celebratory mood because they passed this bill without reading the fine print. Because if they read the fine print and saw the questionability, they might have said, yeah, I don't think so. But along it passed, and ultimately, the Boston and Maine Railroad, uh, actually it was the uh, Massachusetts Central built all the way to uh, Jefferson and Holden. And it had its financial problems. It fell apart. Ultimately, it was reorganized as Massachusetts Central. It was taken over by the Boston and Lowell Railroad, who worked at completing the railroad up to Northampton. And then that, too, was brought into the Boston and Maine fold in the end. So between 1870 and 1871, work to make the railroad a reality first began with land surveys to find the best possible route which took it through Boylston, West Boylston, Holden, Rutland, and beyond. The vision and the money is to become the reality uh, so that towns and villages along the proposed route were approached to buy subscriptions in the railroad in this new endeavor. And they did so with the expectation that the railroad would locate a depot at a convenient location for both passengers and business. Now, why is that important? Because Rutland was one of the first towns to subscribe to the railroad, and it subscribed by paying $25,000 in subscriptions. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Rutland was one of the first. You'd think that some of the larger towns would have been first on board, especially the towns that had some of the original backers of the railroad. But it took a lot of money, and there was a lot of issues and a lot of problems. and. Um, a uh, depression there in the 1870s that brought everything to a halt, but eventually 
They got on board. They managed to put it together, and it was a successful railroad for a number of years. And ultimately, it was the Depression that, that brought down many uh, railroads and brought them to the brink of bankruptcy, including the Boston and Maine. But the thing that undid our line was the hurricane of 1938. The line between from Rutland here all the way to Oakdale was actually closed down. They spiked all the switches and no trains actually passed. So the end of the line literally was at the Rutland uh, train station. With the hurricane in 1938, that, with all the washouts that happened, it was decided it wasn't economic, un, economically feasible to be able to rebuild the line after that. So ultimately that was closed down. And again, that's more to the story that we'll pass on later. So one of the big changes that happened back in the early 1900s was the building of the Wachusett Reservoir. So Boston was a growing city, and the town fathers realized that if we keep growing the way we are, we're not going to have enough water for sewage and everything else. So they began looking for places where they might be able to get water, and of course, building a reservoir was one of them. And as we all know, Wachusett was just the first, Quabbin being the second, being built in the 1930s. So what it meant was, if you look down here, and I'm not sure how well it looks back there, there's the track line that shows the original rail bed as it passed through. This is the Route 12 causeway, the old stone church is down over here, and it came up through Oakdale and then ultimately out to Holden. So a lot of construction had to take place to make that a reality. The dam is right there, and the Clinton trestle is right there at the top. And, it, and that signal that we were looking at earlier is right about there where I got the light. And it came through here to a junction, and there was actually Clinton Dunk Junction right here, and we'll have a picture of that, and came up around. And it crossed over the Worcester, Nashua, and Portland Railroad, which came up through Worcester and, of course, went up to Portland, Maine, or the WNNP for short. So here's a... Aerial view, if you would, uh, about a week and a half ago, I, was, I had added about four or five new slides. I had this one all colored in, and the only thing I'm missing is all the original streets and houses, because I have the, the maps, so I can literally trace in everything and color it in and make it look nice and pretty. But my uh, flash drive burned up, so I couldn't recover everything on it, and luckily, I had a backup that I did a week before, so I only lost about six to 10 slides then I recreated most of them. So trains from the Central Mass here, uh, let's go here, are running east to west. And the Worcester National in Portland is running north-south. The Oakdale station's right here. There was a turntable. And the turntable was an Armstrong turntable. Anybody know why it was called an Armstrong? Manually operated. Manually operated. So they had this big lever, and we'll see a photo of it, and a couple guys. And sometimes it was really well balanced, and this one being a small one, one guy could probably turn the locomotive. And there was also a single stall engine house. There was the coal over here. There was a coal business. And there was a freight house. And the Boston Main Freight House over here, and a secondary company over there. And that freight house down over here, we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that. And also a ball signal that was listed there. Anybody know what a ball signal is? So it's a giant tall pole, and on it usually is one or two balls. And because there was a diamond, when trains approached this, they had to stop 500 yards or 500 feet before they got to the crossing. Conductor got off his train, and he went up to that ball signal, and he either raised one ball for the Worcester National or Portland, or if it was a train for the Central Mass, they would raise two balls. And as long as one of those was displayed, you knew who had rights to operate over that diamond. And we'll find out that that didn't always work. <laughs> it's, it's simple, right? But it didn't always work. So here's the Oakdale Station in about 1889. So the Central Mass here is crossing east to west. And this is the WNNP line here. And they had these wonderful passenger uh, platforms. And overhead, and here's that freight house we're going to talk about here shortly. And this engine here is on the WNNP, and it's heading probably to Worcester. 
I couldn't tell if it's actually a passenger or freight, uh, but along it goes. So a lot of these are copies of copies of copies because the original glass plate was been long ago destroyed, lost, who knows. So we're lucky to have a lot of these copies. Uh, if, if your questions are real brief, I can answer questions as we go along. Otherwise, we could probably hold it toward the end. Now, here's that turntable. And if you look right over here, there's a big lever sticking up. And there's one on the far side. And I guess they must have hired this little boy to be able to turn it. <laughs> Actually, he's not in a very good place. That's a very dangerous place to be. And you can see the one engine stall here. Here's the tender of the switcher engine. And you can see the roof of the station and the infamous track diamond. And you can tell they had a lot of coal all stacked up back in that day. But what a great place for train watching. So here's that freight, freight house. And this was on the Central Mass, so this was their freight house. And what's interesting, too, is a lot of the milk houses that were on here of a, were of a similar design. Here is the ball signal. And there's a ball down at the bottom, and there's one at the top. So right now, this has permission for the WNNP to be able to cross this diamond, going from right to left. And any train coming from uh, Rutland or beyond or coming from Boston had to stop because they don't have the right of way. And over here was a coal business, and they used to just open up these doors back here and be able to dump the coal down into the bins down below, so we made it convenient to load up their coal wagons and the coal trucks. And you can see the switcher engine way down over here and the water tank. As the Wachusett Reservoir was being built, they had hired about five or six photographers. I'm not sure the number. I'd have to check back that. And literally what they did is they took photographs of everything in this whole region, every house, every barn, every farm, every nook, every cranny, the graveyards, you name it. They took photos of it for a record of how things were. And hopefully they reimbursed fairly for all the houses that they took down because behind the behind the shed down below over here where the Quinnipoxit River kind of flowed and meandered through was a village of Oakdale. I believe it's a village of Oakdale. And all those houses were eventually destroyed. The mills were all torn down. The Springdale Mill, most of you are familiar with that. So that was one of those mills because you didn't want all that stuff going into the water that was feeding into a reservoir that those people in Boston were going to drink. So cleaning it up was, was huge. And here we go. Next one. Okay, we have a wreck in 1901. And yeah, that's 35. So what you see here is there's only half of the freight house left. The rest of it's all down the banking. This is Holden Street that went underneath the railroad embankment. This tool shed is knocked off, off the banking, is hanging down off the banking. They got a work train here with a crane to start taking out all the debris. And in the background over there is the Oakdale Station. So on February 28, 1900, Extra Freight 355, and usually what that meant is uh, 355 was the engine number, so it kind of made it easy for identification of the WNNP division of the Boston and Maine crashed into the switcher at the Oakdale Freight Rod Yard this morning at 4 o'clock, severely injuring four different men, all members of the night crew at the Oakdale Freight Yard. The train didn't show up, was, and it was hidden as no signal was seen. Now that's a pretty tall post that we showed you. The engineer and the fireman saying that smoke from the engine was so dense that nothing could be seen. Now, although they were on the lookout for them, without a moment's notice or warning, the engine of the freight crashed into the train on the Central Mass Road, which was lying across the tracks of the WNNP, and it also took out all of that house. It barreled it right down, and it was a wreck. Now, I know it's easy for us to say, OK, you got a signal that controls who's able to cross the diamond and you can't see it because there's smoke covering and obscuring it. What does that tell you? There's an engine on the track or right there. So 
I can't judge them, but you have to ask yourself the question, what were they thinking? Chances are they weren't. They were, they were just barreling through, and maybe the uh, train on the Central Mass branch was delayed for some reason, and they just came barreling through like they always did and never gave it a thought. Yeah, he was on his phone. <laughs> yep. Well, if they had a telegraph on the, on the train, that would have been good. So, but they did have telegraphs. And uh, so I don't know about you, but it kind of makes sense that if you see a ball signal up, or there would have been two for the central mass, that you had to stop. You couldn't barrel on through, but they did. And accidents like that happened all the time in the early days. And the central mass was known because it was a single track line. It was known for its share of accidents. Is that the ball signal right there to the left of the trees? Uh, no, the ball signal is out of sight beyond the, uh, it's off beyond over here. So you're looking at the train on the WNNP line right here. How, how would they, uh, how would they have seen the uh, balls at four in the morning? They have lights that can go into them. And you either could literally put a light hanging, a uh, lantern hanging right under it, it would shine up enough light. And most of the ball signals were red, as far as I know, they were all red. And these were uh, actually, uh, we'll see another picture of it, they were, looked more like a candle pin. Most of them are balls, they actually look like beehives, and they were shaped out of metal, because they were outside all the time, so they had to take some abuse. But they would hang lanterns underneath. What was the date on that wreck again? It was February 28th, 1900. Oftentimes there's a mist in that area when it's cold out or warm out. I used to commute that way a lot. Mm -hmm. So there could have been some fog on top of the smoke. Yeah. Could have been. But you still, you have to see your signals. That's the main thing. I mean, think about it today, they're trying to go with positive train control on all our trains because you have somebody that's not paying attention and is speeding up and, uh, at a curve that's supposed to be 30 miles an hour and they're doing 100. And lo and behold, the train goes running off the tracks, people get killed. So they're trying to control that because humans are humans. We make mistakes. That's just the way it is. Back then, the mistakes could really be costly. And accidents on the railroad were uh, prevalent especially for railroad workers, and, and it wasn't until after 1907 that they started clamping down on the railroads and, and by initiating all kinds of extra safety laws, uh, and one of them being when the Westinghouse air brakes came on board, the idea of a brakeman riding on top of the roof of these cars, when a train had to stop, they got a, a whistle from the engine, and they'd be on top of the car and they'd be cranking down the brake brake wheel hoping to stop the train and they would hop from car to car to car to car uh, in winter time in sleet and snow, imagine that. And you just hope you didn't fall off in between the cars. Or let alone the guy that had the couple of cars and if you got in there too quick or you were too late getting out, you'd be crushed, killed. And one of the things I find ironic is if you read the old newspaper stories where I got the story of this accident, uh, the Western Telegram has all these things on microfiche so it makes it very hard to search. You've got to get out the microfiche and go through it page by page and, and uh, copying them down one by one. But uh, they tell you the gruesome stories of what happened when a train ran over a guy and he's got three pieces there on the... And, and I'm telling you, all the graphic detail, and I'm like, leave nothing for your imagination. Of course, there's newspapers. It kind of sells the story, too. So just below was that coal shed where they put the coal in on the backside at the top, it came down the bottom. So this was WB wood, coal, and ice. And at this point, it had moved out because everybody knew that ultimately the reservoir was coming into place. So you can walk the bottom here at the banking because the rail trail is now on top. And if you look, you can still find coal pieces all over the place. And on the other side of the Y, the other side of the station, you had these two uh, 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 freight houses. This one's for the Boston and Maine. Hastings, Houghton, Flour, Straw, Baled Hay, and Shingles. Nothing like advertising in the old days. You just keep it simple. You don't have to pay for airtime. Commercial fees are nice. So, but, uh, so the trains could pull up right on the front. They could unload up. They just have ramps going from the freight house into the boxcar, and they can unload everything they had. 
and customers would come up on the backside and buy their straw, hail, hail or shingles or whatever they needed. So the switcher engine at Oakdale, I never was able to determine what the actual engine was, the number anyway, but I was able, based on the picture, to determine that it was this class of engine, and they call it an 060, it's a switcher engine, and its purpose is to haul box cars and connect up and, and create trains for uh, the engines to pull in whatever direction. So the N WNNP, you know, we got a moth flying around, uh, would bring boxcars up from Worcester, perhaps, or down from Air and beyond, and they would bring the train into the siding over there, and the switcher would take care of all these cars and make up a train that would go in the central mass, either heading back to Boston or perhaps heading out to Amherst and Northampton and beyond. So that engine, or the similar engine, was there until the reservoir where they eliminated the, the train yard pretty much all together, and the switcher engine was no more. So every locomotive had a number, and in this case, it's a class G4A. Not that that means anything to people, but every little modification or version of it would have a different classification letter at the end. But uh, that was a switcher engine, and if you were a boy or a girl growing up, and you would see that thing all the time, and if you were lucky enough, the fireman would say, hey, how would you like a ride? And you'd get a chance to go around the train yard with this thing. And uh, I imagine that would be a pretty exciting thing to do. I mean, how many of you would like to ride on a steam engine? <laughs> I mean, now at Essex, Connecticut, the Valley Railroad Museum, where I rode the train down there, if you want to ride on the engine, it costs you $500, you have to be trained, you get the insurance, you never know if a boiler is going to explode, and for $500 you can fire the engine. So I had a chance to shovel coal for a little bit, and I can tell you, after, after only about 10 minutes on the footboard, I was covered with coal dust. So, and breathing it in, I can't imagine even being a coal miner, but you're breathing that in all day long, and I got a chance to ring the bell, and I didn't blow the whistle, but that would have been nice, but anyway, that would have been one of the things, and Harold Judkins actually got a chance to ride on engines, and they let him actually drive the steam engine while the fireman and engineer are sitting there, and I just think, well, what a lucky kid he was. So the building of the reservoir is already taking place. All the houses and everything are gone save one, and that was probably a bunkhouse just for the workers at that point. And on one of the views you saw this water tank and the Oakdale stations way down the line. There's a little section house, tool house. And we have a engine, it's a 460, and it's got a freight train behind it, and it's on its way probably in Northampton and beyond. And over here you can see the railroad causeway being built comes across and goes up. Actually, the road, I should say. I don't think the causeway's built at, at this, the railroad causeway's built yet. But uh, no, maybe that is a railroad. Some of these pictures are so light. So you'll notice at the bottom here, this is from a glass plate negative. Now, all of these are online nowadays. So if you want to see hundreds of these kind of photos of every house and I mean, some of you might have relatives that lived out there, and you, you know, the old homestead's long gone. Chances are, you'll find a photo of it. Oakdale Center Station. So nothing fancy here. Um, in another view, uh, I actually see this box on the side, and there's a lady waiting for her train in front. Somebody took her photograph before she got her train. And I was like, what is this little box? I couldn't figure it out. And I blew it up and blew it up and highlighted it, and I realized it was a candy vending machine, one of the earliest little dentine, I think it was dentine, or chiclets, gum machine dispenser. And I actually, and these days, you can find everything online. I actually found a picture of it. I actually made drawings of it. Because if, if and when I get around to drawing a, a plan of uh, Oakdale Station, I'll put it on the side. Uh, I'm a mechanical designer by trade, so one of the things I like doing is drawing up all these things in CAD. Uh, 3D modeling and 2D drawings made from the, my 3D models. So that's pretty much my main contribution here. And here's the station after the move. So they literally took that station and moved it 600 feet or yards, Rick. I keep forgetting which. So they just moved it north to get away from where the water would be crossing over. 
They built a brand new 50,000 gallon water tank. Uh, this is a 440 uh, freight engine. It's just parked there for the moment. The carpenters are either building this giant wooden deck. Now, I don't know how they kept this thing from rotting because there was practically no, gr no height to this. So that must have rotted out real quick because it isn't long after this you'll find that there's no boards left because it rotted out. There's a train order signal, and there's actually two of them at this station. So what is a train order signal? So uh, trains operated by timetables, and the second way they operated is through train orders. So every station had a telegraph, and if the call came in from the dispatcher that said, hold up freight number 355, we don't want them crossing through the diamond, make them park over there, they would raise one of those order boards and it would go up from its uh, vertical position to come straight up. And depending on which track it was, the order board would tell that engineer to stop. And he would go out and get orders to tell him what he was supposed to do next. Sometimes they had to stop somewhere along the line, pick up an extra freight car, who knows what it might have been. But that was all part of the safety that was implemented. And these were added sometime between 1908 and 1911 when they finally completed placing train order signals at all of the Boston main stations. Not every one, but most of them. Now, most of you will not recognize this road because it doesn't exist anymore. But this is the beginning of the rail trail here in Holden. This wall right here, which took uh, uh, the road, and I got to remember what the name of the road was, 41. Actually, I didn't write it down, but I think I got it some. Oh, Newton Street. It's right there. I should have read it. Don't worry, I got to get some new glasses, too. So half of this wall still remains, and there's just a couple pieces of the footing over here. And we all enter past the gate that's underneath where the bridge once was. And when the railroad closed down, they didn't need to go up. And where the parking lot is in Oakdale, You'll get out and immediately you cross over and there's these two rows of giant oak trees and everything that goes up and came to this road. And the photographer is on the hill bank. Back there is a, a sand bank. And my boys, I don't know about anybody else's kids, but they had to climb that sand bank to the top and race themselves and then come down without killing themselves. So that was always one of the things my boys liked to do. So the photographer took a picture of the completed road and ultimately that was done away with. There's the railroad causeway over here. So that bridge, I don't know when they actually took it out. It's probably they took it out in the 40s or something like that, maybe just after World War II. Again, I can kind of find a little bit more history. Now as you're traveling down the railroad, what's another name for a, a ticket-challenged passenger? <laughs> oh, a hobo. Now, uh, you had a question? I did. I was just wondering if you know anything about the people who actually built the railroad. Well, that was a bunch of people, a lot of Irish immigrants for one, and other laborers, not like on the West Coast where they had a lot of Chinese laborers, but a lot of Irish. And they would pay them a day's wages, and it was all done by hand, and they had mule carts and dump carts that are all hand done, and they had a, actually a little railroad that traveled all through the area to pick up all the dirt and refuge and haul it different places. But uh, that's kind of the general thing, so that goes back. And that's what they did for Oakdale here when they built a the reservoir. It was all done by hand. Uh, there was only a few places where there was enough uh, dirt and material to move that they actually had steam shovels. But everything else was pickaxe and shovels and mules to haul it along. So again, there are some glass plate negatives of all of this, and you'll see pictures of this. So on the rail trail, just before the first mill site, where there was a washout there about how many years ago, Ed? Um, there was a major washout there, just past Oakdale. Yeah. So we were looking through, and I said to myself, you know, just before railroad yards, if there were hobos, they'd set up a camp in the woods or something like that. So if I said for the funny funds of it, let's see if we can find any markings. So this rock right here, the dirt was up to right there. And I believe this rock was actually on the banking up above. 
so that somebody could actually carve it. But now it rolled down to the bottom of the banking and it's got buried by the dirt. So my sons and I went out one day, we unburied it and I didn't paint in the rock. That's all done with Photoshop. But you can see it says Hobo Black John. Don't know if he's a real person or not, or he was a kid that had nothing better to do in the summertime. <laughs> and over here was a second rock. I'm sorry that the sun was coming through all the leaves, but there's 1927. Uh, AWR was one person, LO, and there's different, and then there's 1924 down at the bottom. And again, that rock with the OOK, and the, if there was a letter there, I can't even see it, but, and I don't know what OO, Osman. Ostafer Ken Kennedy, I don't know what his name is, but I'll presume maybe kids did that, but it could have been a hobo, so I just call them hobo rocks with a question mark. So next time you walk in Oakdale, and they're off on the uh, right-hand side, before you get to that first water feature, there's a little pond there that used to cross under the railroad tracks and feed a, a little mill that was by the Quinnipoxit. You'll find those. Yeah, who would find those, right? Now, the hobos, I don't know if you know this, but they had their own language. They had all their own symbols. So let's say there was a campman at the end of a freight yard or near a freight yard, and, and there was somebody that would give them some food to eat. Well, they had their symbol saying, somebody will give you food. Or if they had a dog that will tear your leg off, they had a symbol for bad dog. And if there was a uh, farmer or somebody that would chase you off with a shotgun, they had a symbol for that too. So, but most of those were done with either chalk or plenty of coal all over the place, so they would mark it on a tree or something like that. Not sure which, or even on large boulders if they were handy. So whether those are real hobo rocks, markings, we'll never know. So we're traveling down the river, and again, there's a, a number of photos I didn't have, but there are three different bridges, two of which, watch as Greenways, is put up over the Quinnipoxit River, so that gives us access all the way down to Oakdale. Uh, my wife really loves me because she was uh, pregnant one day and I got her to ford the stream at one point. <laughs> Summertime, the water was low enough, so she kept going and I love her for it and she didn't divorce me after that, but, you know, we walked these trails before they actually were completed. And uh, Rick Conard, I owe this photo to because a woman by the name of Doris Hall who lived up on River Street in Holden uh, had this photo and passed along a copy. And it's a steel truss bridge, and then around 1913, they added all these extra supports because in 1913, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mellon took over the Boston and Maine, and he wanted to have his shortcut from Springfield to connect to the Central Mass and save himself uh, a number of miles and cost to transport trains. So they had to stiffen and, and uh, improve all the bridges to take heavier weight. Well, his... Uh, Railroad escapade didn't last very long, and I, and I can't think of the name uh, of the gentleman who took him to court and broke that all up. And that all came crashing down, and the Boston and Maine be became independent of the New Haven once again. But uh, we have that bridge, and the abutments are still there today. So if you go down River Street, here's the River Street Bridge. You'll see some of these uh, stoneworks. Everything on this side is all gone, and there's a house right over here today. Good place for fishing, by the way. Uh, what are some of the locomotives that actually rode through town here? The main one that rode through for all passenger and a lot of the freight were what they call a 440 American. And this one here was one of the last class of Americans for the, for the Boston and Maine, and they were one of the most efficient, best designs. And mainly, they were lightweight, so they could go on all these branch lines that were with 85-pound steel rail. I mean, I don't know what they're up to now in some places, but it's like 300-pound rail. Um, but they had 85-pound rail. And I was lucky enough one time in Rutland, I was walking along, and, and you can always find the rail spikes because just look for a clump of rust, and you know you got something. So I see this clump of rust sticking out of the dirt, and I pull it out, and what it is, it was like a 56-pound rail. So it's only about that tall and about that wide, and it was probably a part of the rail that was used to construct the line. So they had this temporary rail, they had the mules pulling all these dump carts, and uh, 
So I got a piece of that at home. But you can see a typical train down there was never a long train because the Massachusetts Central Branch was never a big passenger uh, affair at any given point. They did have a through train that went from Boston to Northampton, and one of our presidents used to ride it and come through our town here. But most of the time, there would be one or two passenger cars, and on the bottom, uh, the back in this case is a, uh, or maybe it's this one, it's a combine. So you had your baggage mail on the first half of it and the smoker section for all those men that had to smoke the cigars. The ladies didn't have to worry about breathing that in. So that was one of the little conveniences for riding the trains all the way back since before the turn of the 20th century. The other locomotive, mostly for freight at this time, was a 260 Mogul. And one of these still exists, number 1455, is down at Danbury Railroad Museum in Danbury, Connecticut. So you can actually see an engine that looks exactly like this one, still in existence, although it's in pretty rough shape nowadays. The tender was so rotted that the whole top half of that tender in the back was ready to fall right down over the trucks. So they've been stabilizing it. They built a new frame and, and allowed drainage and air to go through and keep it from rusting away. But that was your main engine here, and that was used all the way to the end of steam. And the engine 1455 was one of the last steam engines to run on the Boston and Maine. And it came from Clinton to Boston, or from Boston to Clinton. So that would have been a familiar engine that you would have saw daily. So now we've gotten past uh, River Street, and we're into Holden. This is what's called the Quinnipoxit Depot. And there were two factories that were served by the Quinnipoxit Depot. And right now there's a house on this property. So you can see the main track. And the second track here is often referred to as the house track. Mm -hmm. So boxcars could pull up to the freight house here and unload. There's one over here. I don't know if it's just empty or for storage. And on the other side is what's called a milk house. So back in the days of, of creameries and things like that. The farmers would bring a wagon full of their milk cans. They would bring it to the, the milk house here and the first train of the day usually, very early in the morning, would come down and make a stop at all these places, pick up the milk and head over to H.P. Hood and a couple other places more toward Boston. And eventually, bigger farms got bigger and bigger and the small little farms couldn't compete. And over time, as you know, dairy farms started going bye-bye across the, all of New England here, and there's not too many left in our region. So that's Quinnipoxit. And you can see on this one here, you can see the telegraph line. So they had a railway express agency in here. So there was a station agent and a telegraph operator. So you could take, well, it wouldn't be snail mail. You'd have to walk into the station. You would give your letter, and it would be going to the telegraph, and he would type it up. It would get to the other source. Somebody would get it on a piece of paper and then deliver it to whoever you want. So that was high-speed communications. This photo I love. So uh, Chuck Skilling, I owe this to. There was actually three photos uh, donated by somebody anonymously, and I call them the happy couple. And I love it because, you know, they're posing for the picture, perhaps, I'm guessing. They're going on their honeymoon. And I can tell these are two different He's got his little straw hat. And he's got his little, uh, what do they call those little golfing hats now? What's the proper term? A driving cap? A driving cap? I'm not, oh, okay. And he's picking a fight. I don't know if that's wise with the bride of the... The groom here, because she's on the attack and he's ready to defend himself. <laughs> Gotta love those brothers, huh, ladies? <laughs> now, it isn't often that you'll see pictures with people posing at the sta station. I only have uh, three or four, and it's rarer to even see a photograph inside a station. Not too many. And usually if it's inside a station, it might be some relative taking a picture of the station agent who's your family member, your dad, or your grandfather, and something like that. And at this point in time, the station colors were a pond bottom green, is what some folks love to call it. It's kind of an olive green and a little stone gray up top. 
And how did you stop a train in the old days without throwing your body across a track, like in the old so silent movies? Well, you put a flag out, and there's two flag post holders here. But Quinnipoxit also had what's called, and you can just barely see it here, it was called a flag stop signal. So that was used for passengers to stop a passenger train. So if you had to catch a train at 6.05, the station agent had gone home for the day, it's getting dark, uh, you would take the order board and it was a simple matter, of, there was a lever at the bottom and you literally just turned the board so that the board went perpendicular to the track and the engine crew, if the timetable said they had to stop to pick up passengers, they'd be on the lookout or you could stand on the platform waving your arms looking crazy and they might stop for you. And then the conductor would reset the board afterwards once you boarded the train. So most of these stations also had the flag stop signal. And once again, I gotta owe it to Rick here because I've actually drawn drawings and models of it. But Rick actually has remnants of the one that was out in Sudbury or South Sudbury? Sudbury. Sudbury. And if you ever found pieces of that, that's about as rare as it gets because there's only about four of them left in existence that I know of. So you left Quinnick Poxit, and in no time at all, you were crossing what was the Providence and Worcester Railroad tracks. But this was the line that went from Worcester to Kentucky, New Hampshire originally. So or, um, it would otherwise be known as the Worcester Peterborough branch. And nowadays, this just goes up to Gardner, Mass. So for me, I live about 150 yards from the railroad track. So I'll hear the trains come through on their way to Gardner where they interchange with Norfolk Southern or Pan Am Railroad nowadays. So again, back in 1913, the original bridge was replaced by the steel girder type here. And there must have been something happening with the embankment over here because they replaced it with all concrete. But this one originally has the old granite stone base and you can still see that there today. So they're all houses over here. And who knows what this little thing is here? I know it's not very clear. So our railroad bus would know. Anybody know what this Tell thing is? Tell. Telltale. So you remember your brakemen, they're riding on top of the cars in the old days. Mm -hmm. And what would happen if you didn't duck in time? <laughs> so you're riding on top of the car, you're paying attention, you're, you're lighting up your cigarette, you're chewing the breeze with the guy in the next box car, and all of a sudden, whack on the back of your head, this chain's hanging down. So you knew get down fast because depending on how fast the train was going you didn't have much time to duck and get out of the way <coughs> so every bridge overpass all of them had telltales and this is probably a, a, a main train coming from northampton it's engine 1025 and that's one of those uh four four americans and you can't see it very well over here but there's a rail on top of rail rest so there's the pieces of some of them along the rail beds around here. So every mile or so, they would have these, what they call rail rests. They were made out of wood originally, concrete in later days. And they'd have a section of track. Because if the track broke, or in the old days, because of the, the smaller uh, rail size, they actually would peel up. And if, a, if it peeled up because it snagged on a wheel or the axles, it could literally rip through the floorboards of, the, of your coach and just tear it up as it's going through and God help you if you're in the aisle. Or if the train starts to derail, that piece of steel is coming through you. So, but if there was ever a problem, they had rails to replace. And on the right-hand side, going west, would be milepost. And we're gonna talk about that in, in a minute. And on the left-hand side, would be all the telegraph poles. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Here is the Jefferson Depot in 1908. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, that's next to the Wong Dynasty. No, it's not. The Boston and Maine, for whatever reason, had this Jefferson Depot on the Central Mass Branch but the, the Jefferson Depot that's next to the Wong Dynasty was actually on the Worcester Peterborough branch. They were only about 500 yards apart. They were separated, and you can see them in aerial maps where they were. 
And so a lot of people think, oh, it's one Jefferson station. And I tell them, no, there was two. And again, in the photo here, most stations of the original Massachusetts design and had this gable hip roof with big overhangs. So you're a passenger, you didn't have to wait out in the rain if somehow the station was closed. So they had all these large overhangs. Uh, Rick Connard, who lives in Wayland, Wayland still has this original design. And they have a freight house across the street that they just originally, uh, that they just recently restored in the past couple years. And this postcard, be, dating around 1908, uh, shows what possibly is the original colors of the central mass. And Harold Druckins, and in one of his little newspaper clippings, talked about how the Rutland station was repainted in 1906. And he describes what was the original colors of these stations. It was stated in a uh, article to, let's see if I actually got it here, in the Worcester Telegram <clears throat> of December 22, 1906, and I'll just read this, Rutland. A crew of carpenters and painters in the employee of the Boston and Maine Railroad had been busy a week or more repairing and repainting all the buildings at the three Rutland stations on the Central Massachusetts Railroad. At Rutland Center Depot, and the freight house, milk house, and section houses were heretofore been painted a colonial yellow with dark red trimmings. So it's interesting that this postcard, which was actually painted in Germany, by the way, uh, has what may be, you know, I think the photographer who took the original glass plate negative of this and wanted to have the postcards printed probably had a copy that said, it's yellow up top, it's red down below, and the artists in Germany did what they did. And the only difference here is it actually has a third color. The windows and trim appear to be some kind of dark green. There's a penny scale out here for those of you who are ambitious and want to find out your weight. This one did not give you a ticket and give you a fortune. So you would put in your uh, penny and find out the bad news. <laughs> here is the flag stop signal again and the freight house, which was separate. So in Weston is another one of the original uh, depots, but it's a combination passenger freight house. They're morphed together. So Rutland still has the original. And what's funny here is Wayland is actually mirror opposite of this station. This door right here is for the men's room, and the door is on the outside. So engine crew could actually get off the train and use the restroom or any other men who happened to be walking by. But the ladies, they were inside. They had their own door. And on the other side of this bu building was the ladies' restroom. And that was typical on all of these. And there's the train order signal right here. And you can see the patch up on the roof here. And what they did is they literally cut a hole through everything to put the post through. And there were rods that actually went into the station agent's office. And again, one of the slides I don't have tonight. But there are two big cast iron levers in there, uh, one for inbound, one for outbound. So uh, if the train was coming from Oakdale and was heading its way toward Northampton, you would be outbound. And if you had to give your train crew train orders, you'd grab that lever, squeeze the handle, and throw the lever up to raise that lever. Now, they have big counterweights on these things. But what happened on so many cases, uh, if you didn't grease these things and lube them, it would be hard to raise these levers. In the Jefferson Station, somebody tried, there was, the levers were once there. Somebody tried to raise the order boards when they were frozen in place, and they literally snapped off the lever, because I think what they did is they put a piece of pipe on the end and tried to yank it and literally broke it in half. And the other problem with those levers were if you were a station agent, you had these things sticking out of the wall right at head height. So what happened was, is, you know, you had these head accidents and guys had these black marks all over their head and you knew that was a station agent just because he had the bruises on his forehead. <laughs> so what some of the guys used to do was put rubber hoses on the end of these things. They whacked it. They weren't just poking their eyes out and, you know, having black bruises all over their heads. So one of the first things that disappeared when a train station, the, the order stations were closed was they took the levers out. And the other thing, too, was the two boards that are hanging down there, they would remove those. So anytime you see a photo and there's no boards in the, in the uh, 
top of the mast over here, you know that train order station is closed. Here's another view of Jefferson. So we're looking from the track end. And one of the things that is unique to the Jefferson station and one other station, what's the other station that had a trolley, Rick? I can't think of it offhand. South Bolton had an overpass. But didn't the, the trolley <laughs> cross over to come near the station? Sure. Okay. Well, anyway, we had it good here in Holden because you could catch the trolley from Worcester and actually further points beyond because it came from the Worcester Consolidated, which had all of the Worcester area and other areas that all interconnected all over the state. So you could take a, tr a trolley from Worcester connect up to what was the Worcester and Holden, and it would bring you right to this train station. So this is commuter traveling circa 1908. It might not get you there that fast. Now, there's a number of trolley museums and, and out in Lowell, they run streetcars out there, so every time I take my boys out, we gotta ride the trolleys. And as you know, they don't move very fast, and uh, they have an open car, so it's nice in the summertime to sit there in the open, get the breeze, you can see everything, and it's pretty nice. So what else do you see at a station? Well, here's that penny scale again. And they still exist. The collectors have these things. All the stations had three signs. There's one here, there's one on the end of the building, and here's the second one that says Jefferson. You can see this telephone cross arm on the top of the ridge of the station because there are telegraph lines that crossed right over the station. So not exactly a thing of beauty. And they had these wonderful braces here, knee braces, that supported the roof. And on all of these doors, there was this little ornamental scroll. And that was the only ornamentation that any of these stations had. Now. When it comes to signals back in the old days, they had an oil lamp at the top of that uh, train order signal and any other signal that was. So once a week, they had a signal inspection crew that would go down the line, and part of their, do their doing was to stop at the signal. Somebody would climb the signal. Because there were oil lanterns in the early days, somebody had to trim the wicks. They had to refill the uh, fuel pot. I, I presume sometimes they just brought up everything with them and took back the old one. But imagine climbing the ladder on that thing during the winter time, because you have to trim the wicks and make sure it's lit. And I think they, if I recall correctly, the oil lanterns made by Peter Gray and Sons, they lasted for about eight days. And back then, they didn't give off a whole lot of light. Now, on that train order signal, there's actually three roundels, is what they're called. It was one red, one green, and one uh, yellow. So if the order boards were hanging down, you'd see the green lit, and you knew you could proceed. Uh, one of the rules for operating by train order was if the arm was at the 45 degree position, you see a yellow light. It would allow you to pass the station, but you would have to be prepared to stop at the next signal or the next station. And because the WNMP was a very hilly line, the trains were notoriously late all the time. So I actually have a picture of the West Boylston train station where you see both order boards at 45 degrees. And that's, like, that's rare. Almost very few other stations ever use the 45 degree position, according to some of the old timers I talked to. But on the WNMP, the trains were laid often enough and they had the 45 degree. And if they had to stop, of course, when the order board was horizontal, the red would be shown and they'd know to stop. And if all else failed, they all had their flag staffs there, so they would put out a red flag just in case, because, yeah, then something could happen. Maybe the signal froze up, the lever broke, who knows. But you would have a secondary way beside a red lantern, and at dusk and nighttime, they'd always have the red lantern, because you wouldn't see the flag necessarily. And if it meant the conductor or the station agent sitting there on the tracks, and he'd be swinging his lantern back and forth to indicate a stop. And that's what they would do. How am I doing on time here? Eight o'clock. Can I keep going, Sheila? Are you guys good with me going a little bit longer? I haven't even gotten the rut one yet. So here's another picture. They had a boxcar. And whenever they transferred stuff, and when they went through the freight yards, they used a chalk mark 
on the freight car where they were going. And right here, you can't see it, but on the glass plate, you can read Jefferson. So here is a conductor, I guess. They've offloaded the giant wooden box onto a horse wagon. Here's our little penny scale. And you notice how many cross arms there are on this telephone pole. I have one in my basement. I got the wood pegs and everything I found from another old telephone pole, and I got all the glass insulators, so I got to hang it in my garage or something, because they're pretty long. And there were 10 glass insulators on each arm, and there was usually seven arms, and there's usually another insulator at the top dead center, and sometimes a couple off to the side. So there was usually at least 80 cross arms with wires on them. And you'll see, uh, when we get to Rutland, you guys set a record. There's a trolley, and the gentleman who owned this glass plate collection uh, was, uh, uh, gave me a nice big blow up over here. And the poster is for the Barnum and Bailey Circus, and I found out this was a generic poster, but I found out it was 1908 was the time that this circus went through uh, Worcester here. And there's two posters on them. I know you can't read them, but it's Dancing at Lincoln Park. So that was the way to answer. And uh, how many of you remember dancing at Lincoln Park? <laughs> no hands? Oh, I guess it's before our time. There was talk of taking the streetcar and bringing it all the way to Jefferson, but I never, I mean uh, Rutland, but that never materialized. Milepost. How many want to guess what a milepost? Hint has to do with a mile. <laughs> so again, on the Outbound side from Boston, always the right side with the engineer, were what were called mileposts. And every one of them was indicated with a letter and a set of numbers. And it told you whereabouts you were on the branch line. And in this case, N stands for Northampton. It's 53 miles to Northampton. And where this post is, is below it on the opposite side, was B for Boston. It was 51 miles to Boston. Now, why a milepost? Well, in 1903, Boston and Maine put these mileposts up all over the system. They're all made out of granite. Some places it was a pink granite. But um, they were used to help an engineer know where he was, to gauge his speed, because if he was running late, he might speed up to uh, make up some time. And if there was any problems along the way, track issues, they could report to the next station and tell the section crew, hey, there's a problem. There was a broken rail over there, and we felt it going over at mile post uh, B-51, and they would know exactly where to head out and take care of that problem before it became an accident. So ours go all the way up to 104 miles. So we've repainted a few of those. So now you know what they are. And the painting and the numbers and everything matched the specifications laid out by the Boston Maine. Every railroad had standards. They had standard plans for everything. There is a 1900 plan for a mile post, and it tells you how big, how wide, how deep, and the lettering. And they had plans to tell you what the lettering's supposed to look like. So you had everything you need to make your little stencils and go out and paint your post and, and things like that. So you'll occasionally see these stone posts. Mushkapag, hey! We're in Rutland, and I'm not too, too late. So the original Flagstop shelter was opened in 1887, I believe, was when the rail line was first opened. And it was just an original open station. Now, I don't believe this was from a glass plate negative. The f there's so many dots and everything kind of looking like it's in a, a, a film camera that's been degraded by the different things that eat up film. But it's the only one we have to show what the original Muscapog shelter looked like. And that, again, was from Harold Juckin's collection that he saved. And you can see the tracks at the bottom. So right now where the shelter is, there is a rock announcing the Mass Central Rail Trail. And right over here, probably right next to it, is a picnic table. And here is the original uh, train station. That was built because of the sanitarium. They had enough passengers coming and going that it was justifiable. And, and Harold took these notes because he was talking to Maddie Smith, who became the station agent in place of her father when the station was opened up. 
And she did a little bit of everything that Harold took down. So let's see, 55. I'm going to read my little notes here. So far, I haven't had to read mo most of my notes. My grandfather farm over like where Heifer Project is now, down in Bath, though, um, close to the well, board of the Princeton line, I think, at the railroad track. Mm -hmm. And in 1938, he moved up to the center of town because my grandmother didn't like living out there. And he built a, there was a small house, we lived right on the main street in Rutland, there was a small house, and he built a big house around it. And um, when we were redoing the house, we took up the floor in the hallway upstairs, and lo and behold, on the, on the floorboards, Whoa. he got his, it says, Georgie Smith Muscapog Mass. Whoa. So his, the floorboards for the house that he did were shipped by way of the Muscapog station. <laughs> nice little memento. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. About f eight years, nine years ago, I almost had a chance to buy the Muscapog, one of the Muscapog train station signs. It went for 350 and I, I figured my wife Kathy would kill me if I bought it. <laughs> but um, you can see some of the train station signs at the Historic Society. And of course, Alan Jenkins, who owns the old family home there, the, the Rutland station sign is still on the front of the barn with some of the engine numbers from the train crash that happened in uh, 1932. So Maddie Smith takes over for running the station and as she puts it, she was the jack of all trades. She had to unload the baggages. She had to load the baggages. She had to make sure the passengers were ticketed and everything was in order. She had to make sure the mail was ready to go or take the mail in and make sure it was secure. And you can see the the uh, the buses here, and they're actually eight passenger. I know it's too dark because I don't have an original copy of this one, but uh, I don't know what they called these things back back then. A hack. Well, I know when the they had the automobiles, they call them a hack, but they were calling the old horse runs hacks too. I think so. It could be. So with uh, well, the omnibus was a horse drawn trolley. So it had tracks, it rode on a track, but it was pulled by a horse. So that's an omnibus. Now, so, yes? Um, it looks like, of course, you've got the station track, a passing track. Yep. And isn't that a, a, uh, a switch and another, uh, like a siding that goes off to the right? That, that, yep. Is that a siding? Yes, siding? it is. Oh, I've uh, seen that yeah, it ended just oh, over was here. A, was that a coal yard? No, not that I know of. Uh, I've only seen, I've seen track maps that just showed it hanging off to the side. I don't know if maybe they occasionally parked a box car there or when, when the section crews came, they might park their speeder over there or something like that. I think I read someplace that the uh, coal for the state hospital was delivered at Muscapine. That's why I wondered if it was a coal. Could be. Right. It is? Yeah. Ah, see, I learned something new. Because at Rutland Station, they also had a coal dealer, and they, most of the town got the coal over there. So that's a good, good story. Yes. Oh, I wasn't sure if you had your hand up. OK. So here we have the beautiful grounds of Muscapog Station. You got rocks around the bottom, all different flowers and planted up here. And lo and behold, way down over here is Maddie Smith or Martha Smith. She's peeking out, wondering what this photographer is doing. Now, she won a number of awards from the railroads for maintaining the beauty of the stations because that was, you know, when passengers came. Did you want to walk into a station that looked like it was the uh, Beer Hall of America? Or in some subway stations in some cities in, the, in, the, in days gone past? But she maintained the property because there was only so many trains that came through the course of a day. So she had extra time. And eventually when the work rules changed, she had to have another helper to take care of the baggage and all that. 
and she told Harold that um, that there were times when there was there wasn't enough for her to do, let alone have two of them take care of it. So if you notice above her head, there's a flag. So it's a red flag. So there's a train that's going to be coming and stopping. They got the baggage cart here ready to haul off, and right behind it is a milk house. And again, today where the station is here, you have the rock for the announcing the rail trail and a picnic bench sitting where the station once stood. And of course, the parking lot nowadays is over here. I didn't understand. Is, was she the agent? Yes. Oh. And eventually, there was technically two of them. So I actually was reading through the station agent list, and there was one year they listed him, but they didn't list her. And I thought, that's not good, because she was there to the last day that the station was open. So I thought it was like, they couldn't take the time to put her name there, but they put his name. I don't know. So yes, sir? Did you know where she lived? Yes, I do. Or what is it? We'll see that in a second. Okay. Although Smith is a very common name, it was a very large family here in Rutland. And across the street, you see the original Smith household. Now, I don't know who owns it today. So she would walk out the front door and her dad, it was her dad's farm and he was one of the Smith sons because the original, one of the houses on Main Street was the original Smith family and then the sons all grew up and daughters and married off and went their own places and he uh, either bought the farm or built the farm. I don't know the history of it, their point. But she'd walk out and have this terrible commute. <laughs> And she commented to Harold Jenkins, yeah, it's just a nice three-minute walk to the station to work, she said. And I thought, boy, that's rough. <laughs> How many of you have to drive 45 minutes or an hour or more? <laughs> that traffic must have been a killer. So I believe I have the right house, correct? Yes, yes OK. So now we get to 1932, and just before you get to the Rutland Station, there was a train wreck, as we mentioned. I believe Harold took this photo and a few others that we'll see. So basically what happened in 1932 is the Depression had really hit, and seniority to be an engineer on a locomotive, you had to be up there in years. And if you were anything less, you didn't have a job. And both the engineer and the fireman that day, both were very senior men. And a few years ago, I caught a blog where the grandson of the uh, fireman was trying to find details about the wreck. So luckily, I caught it and emailed him and says, I can tell you about it. And I was able to supply him the interstate commerce report on the wreck itself, the whole review of the wreck, why it happened, how it happened and gave him some of the photos. Uh, but one of the things I found out was is there's more to the story than meets the eye. Now, why did the wreck happen? Well, the dispatcher out in Greenfield wrote what was called a lap order. What's a lap order? A lap order gave two trains coming in all two different directions on a single track the authority to operate at this approximately the same time. Now, normally, that's not an issue. Because it might happen to say extra 355 was to operate to Rutland and stop. And normally for this train, that's what happened. It stopped at the station. It might drop off some coal at the uh, E.D. Marsh Coal Company. Maybe it dropped off a boxcar. It would then turn around and head back toward Northampton. And there would be occasionally a train coming up from Oakdale that would also stop at Rutland, drop off its wears and then turn around. But on this day, it was a heavy rain. The conductor, and I'm, I can't go into all the details for time here, the conductor had made it very clear what their instructions were when they came to the, to the train. They had a boxcar that they had to drop off. So once they disconnected the, the, the back half of the train, including the caboose, uh, they were going to haul this one car out to pass the end of the house switch, flip the switch, and then back back into the freight house. But what happened was, it was really raining. The train just kept going. And the conductor was shouting, and everybody, was, the guy at the last switch was like, you know, stop. Where, where are you going? They kept going. 
the one of the men in the caboose was like, where are we going? And he started climbing over the cars, trying to get and yell to the, to the engineer and the fireman to stop. But they kept going. And then lo and behold, it didn't take long. Often they had their, quote, cornfield meet, is what the generic term was. And the crew of the engine coming up from Oakdale saw what was happening, and they, quote, joined the birds. They jumped off the engine and saved their life properly. But for whatever reason, the engine, uh, the crew on this engine, uh, they didn't see anything, and they were crushed when the tender just compacted into the cab of the engine, and, and they were crushed and killed. And, and chances are the coroner probably just ruled their death accident by train wreck. Uh, I'd love to get the coroner's report to see how detailed he went because I have a hard time seeing that these two super experienced men just ran past for the fun of it. And I thought, uh, maybe they're playing a joke. Well, it's not April Fool's, and why would you want to play a joke when it's the depression and there's a chance that somebody could turn you in and you can lose your job? And that would be the last thing you wanted to do was to lose your job. So. My guess, and I'll never, I can't prove it unless I found the coroner's reports, and it might shed some light, maybe it won't, is that one of them might have had some kind of stroke, collapsed on the foot plate, and the other one was tending to him, and, and who knows what happened, and they weren't paying attention. Of course, one of them probably wasn't paying attention, and uh, lo and behold, the accident happened, and two men were killed. And uh, we were talking about the Boy Scouts earlier today, so if somebody gave me a ring and said, yeah, we got one of our boys trying to do a project for his Eagle Scouts. So I just kind of stirred him in the direction and he did his homework and placed a uh, little rock memorial up at that site today. And of course, Harold had to have a map to find the exact location. And uh, so I actually have that. I have all those handwritten notes copied from his little notebook that he kept, kept in his paper. And sometimes he wrote it on, on paper. Oh, I wanted to tell you a couple stories of Mushkapog. Let me go backwards just a bit, because I think you'll like this. So, you got the station here. And which one was it? Got that one? Ah! How many know what that little thing is in the left-hand corner? Come on, I know you guys know what this is. Well, it's a crossing bell. So obviously when a train came, it was electrified, and you would hear the ding, 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 and I don't know if there was any flashing lights at all, but that warning bell was there to warn cars that they needed to stop. Well, I have to tell you about a true story about two of your former townsfolk here. And I have to reveal their names at some point. And when you find out who they are, you might be shocked. So I want to prepare you in advance in case any of you ladies might swoon uh, when you hear these names. But um, we had two little boys, well, two young boys. This is about somewhere around 1928, 29, 30, somewhere in there. I don't remember exactly. The story was given to me by one of the perpetrators of this crime. And uh, it has to do with that bell. So the, my story is two boys in the Mushkapog warning bell. So I just want to remember to remind you that the statute of limitations for any criminal prosecutions by the railroad or other society, <laughs> other enforcement, uh, has long passed. So these boys are free and clear. So. You know, no charges are going to be filed, and, and uh, but anyway, here's the story. So sometime around two, 1930, two local boys, brothers in fact, with nothing the better to do, decided to play a prank on the station agent, which was Maddie Smith and the other station agent that was there at the station. So passing near the station one day, one of these two hatched a scheme, and they set about to put their plan into motion, gathering up some rocks. They approached a grade crossing and hid themselves amongst the bushes. Then they began their bombardment by pitching their rocks one by one at the warning bell. Why, you say? Well, to make it sound like an unexpected train's approaching. Now, chances are, I don't think their pitching was that great that they got a ding, 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 ding. But anyway, 
they did hit the bell, and Martha and the other station agent heard it, and they came out yelling. Of course, they knew exactly where to look, and it wasn't long before they saw these two hiding in the bushes. Well, they realized the jig is up, and they skedaddled out of the sight. So they made good their escape. They avoided capture. Now the story can be told of their mischief deed, now part of Rutland's railroad lore, and you guys are hearing it first tonight because I don't even know if you know about this story, Sheila, because one of the perpetrators told me about this story. And I was, at, I was blessed to be able to go over his house one afternoon and spend the time, and as we were talking about uh, Rutland and everything, he uh, jogged his memory and he says, oh yeah, let me tell you a story about myself and my brother. And I just had to crack up because these are the kind of stories that are lost over time. So who were these two brothers? Hold your breath. How many of you know the Elanovis? No. Attilio no. and Hugo. No. Your town selectman for a number of years and your police chief for a number of years. <laughs> yes, such ostentatious beginnings for those two. <laughs> but I just had to love it. I just, I figured you had to hear the story. <laughs> Now, T, as he was known around town, am I correct? He was known as T? Yes. And uh, he has more to do with the railroad here. When the railroad closed out in, the, in 1938, he was a young budding carpenter. So he and his father decided they needed a new barn on Pomagusset Road. And uh, they bought the Jefferson Station for $50. He disassembled it. It was all wood, peg, and tenon. So it was easy to take apart, and they hauled all the lumber back, and they ultimately built a barn behind his parents' house. And the men's room door was actually the main door next to the barn doors, and it still had men across the top of it. <laughs> and that barn lasted until the tornado of 53, because it went right through the barn and took it out. Well, he decided at some point he wanted to build his own house. So he bought the Rutland Depot and the freight house and the water tank, disassembled those and brought the lumber and built his house on Pomagusset Road. And he took me down to the basement and you could see the old lead paint on the boards underneath the floors and you could see some of the uh, original coloring. And, the, and I, I wanted to take a speck of paint just to be able to say, yeah, it was this color. But, uh, so he built his house out of the boards from the Rutland train station and everything. And uh, that was owned by his daughter. And I don't know if she's still living there or not. No. And uh, so I have a picture on the front yard. It was painted a colonial yellow back when he owned it, the same color as the station. I don't know if that's why he picked the color, because not too many people have, you know, a nice bright colonial yellow for a color of the house. but. It was nice, so I got a picture of him on his front yard. And he took me all around the station sites. And one of the places where they used to park to access the tracks was going through the woods near the pond after the, the trestles there, after the Rutland train, train station. They had a little turnaround there. And he takes his car down there. And it's like, so I thought he was going to pull in and turn around. Well, he starts driving through the woods. And I'm like, hey, T, you don't have to take me through here. He takes me all through and he's scratching his car up and I don't know what Susan thought about it after when she saw the car. But then we get back to the Rutland station and he says, oh yeah, I'm going to show you to where the water tank was. So he drives onto the property of the, I think it's still the Marsh family, do you know where the station once stood, where the water tank was? Well, the owner who was there, and I can't think of his name now, comes out of the house yelling, I'm calling the cops on you guys, and I'm like, and I said, T, are you sure we, got, we can do this? Oh, yeah, he said. And the owner, he's yelling, he's swearing, he's cursing. I'm like, oh, no, we're going to be arrested. And he says, T, is that you? I said, yeah, I was just going to show him where the water tank was. Because like, apparently there were some people who walked the section over here and actually left his gates open so his goats and things would get out and, out and about. And he was a little teed off about that. But he warmed up to us once, you know, I told him what we were up to and all that. And then he said, well, maybe I'll get a caboose and park it out front. And I says, you realize if you did that, everybody's going to be on your property. <laughs> so, yes? The house where the rail trail future site 
is going to be was Hugo's house. Right. So it kind of all ties in. Yeah. Now, isn't that where your headquarters are right now, Ed? Where it's Hugo's house? Road. Yeah, but it's his house. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it right. Is. And one of the benches, the train benches from the Rutland Station was on the front porch for a long time. I don't know if it's still there or not. I was one of one of those things. Wayland still has their benches. They're really nice cast with Boston and Maine on it and everything. Anyway, but back to Mushkapog, another story here. So Mushkapog must have been the wrong side of the tracks out here in Rutland because there was a crime wave that went on. And I want to read a story from February 23rd, 1914. So you'll like this. It says, Mushkapog Railroad Station on the Boston and Maine, and the title is Get 13 Cents by Robbing Station, Thieves Ransack the Depot at Mushkapog, Third Time in Four Months. So on the Boston and Maine Railroad was broken into the third time in four months after midnight this morning, and 13 cents, as well as 120 pieces of gum and candy were stolen. <laughs> I would have thought stealing the tickets to get free rides anywhere you want would have been nice. It says a panel was cut from the ticket, ticket office door so that a spring lock could be moved and the door opened. A match vendor was smashed in its contents, 13 cents, was taken from it. The gun machine was open without breaking it. A key probably was used. Now who might have access to a key? Hmm. The tickets were mixed. Mixed. Something was missing. The empty cash box was ripped off and the express bundles were slammed around. But none were stolen. The transmitter of the telephone was broken, and an attempt was made to get at the coin receptacle of the pay station. The station was also broken into October 4th and on November 1st. So I like how uh, Maddie says the station was all mussed up. <laughs> Until I read that, I'm like, mussed up? What kind of term is that? Mussed up, mushkapog? Maybe it's Indian. I don't know. But. Uh, so believe me, the Illinois brothers had nothing to do with this crime spree because they weren't even born yet. <laughs> so we know they're innocent. So I've got to protect the family name to some degree. Anyway, let's go on here. What time do I got? So, whoops. So there's another picture. They hauled the two engines after the wreck down toward... Uh, Rutland Station, and they were off to the side. It was at this point that, at some point, that Harold climbed aboard. And what he has is there was a bell up in here. He took the bell off of one of these locomotives. There was a marker light that's still on the house today next to the front door. And at the top of each of the boilers was the number plates. And he took both number plates. One of them must have been broken because he only has the numbers on top of the uh, uh, the barn door. Another picture of this. Those, those, those engines, as bad as they looked, they often rebuilt them and put them back out on the road. Yes, they, they did. They were total, but nope. The shops would put them back on the road again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So here, I love this little shot because here this guy in a nice white jacket is, has a top hat and he's tipping his cap to the photographer. And I don't know if he's selling patent medicines at this time or not, but who knows what's in his uh, steamer trunk and some, something down here. So where the station once stood, you can see there were steps going up and down, not necessarily handicap accessible by today's standards. The train is coming from Northampton direction heading toward Boston. There is the milk house. Here's another picture from the water tank. So one of the things Harold used to like to do is take a photo of his and he'd make a Christmas card and send it to all his friends. So there's a copy of a copy of a copy of this at the Historic Society here. But I have one of his Christmas cards that I was able to scan that photo off. And I love to find his app, two albums. Yes, sir? Where, where was the station located? On Pomegusset Road. Oh. And I don't know, you see this lady here, she's got her bag in hand and she looks like she's running to catch the train. Now, 
What's wrong with that? And for that matter, what's wrong with the photographer? Huh? Well, they're crossing the tracks, but they're not supposed to be on the tracks. From the get-go, railroad property said, you are not to be trespassing. You are not to be on these tracks. And with the train looking like it's getting ready to proceed, because if I see the smoke here, it looks like it's puffing out. So either that train is starting, or he's been firing, he's been throwing more coal in the fire there or something, but it looks like it's ready to go. You can see the freight house here, some of the men, there's a boxcar. So the concrete footings are still here, and we walk this section now going on the Route 56. Now, that water tank was fed from uh, a spring at somebody's house. I forgot what the woman's name was. And normally, you would not ever want to drink water from these water tanks because for various reasons, they were not healthy. However, because this came from a spring, the water was always nice and ice cold and clear, so everybody used to come, and the train crews used to come, and they'd fill their water bottle. They had these big metal cans, which I got at home, and they'd fill them up with water, and they'd have nice cold water to drink. So that was one of the few water tanks that you could drink and not have to worry about getting bacterias and all these other little things that grow in water. Now, here's a picture of the station, and I believe this is the house that's still there today. You can see a little Model T over here. Here's the station itself. And here's E.D. Marsh Coal. And right there is a little coal car, I guess, or it's a open hopper. And as I was trying to figure out who the coal owner was, because I searched everywhere online, and it took me quite a while to figure it out, I actually stumbled on to a nice little story about E.D. Marsh. So. Starting at the end of the, uh, of, or at the beginning of 1900, 1902, 1918, 1923, and 22, there were coal strikes that were happening across the country. Life in the mines was pretty horrid, and unions were trying, trying to get started, and uh, mine owners were doing everything possible to stop that, and there were coal strikes. And one strike happened in 1921, lasted through 1922, and because of price gouging, nothing new to things today, uh, Massachusetts actually appointed a uh, commissioner to oversee uh, coal and things like that to make sure people could heat their houses in the winter. So they would go around to all the coal dealership and find out who was gouging and find out who was trying to take care of uh, the people without gouging. So the story is this. So. To Mr. James J. Phelan, State Emergency Fuel Administrator at the State House at Boston, Dear Sir, the fuel situation in Rutland has, I believe, been better than the average community. We have but one local dealer, E.D. Marsh, and he has been able to supply citizens with either hard or soft coal. He has cooperated with me and kept the price as low as any in the vicinity and lower than many. By the use of wood, some have been able to save coal. And as far as they was able to learn, no one suffered by reason of being without fuel. But many have used coal sparingly to get along. Respectfully yours, L.M. Hump, Local Emergency Fuel Distributor for Rutland, Mass. So I was taken from a report for the state back in May 2nd, 1923. Everything's online these days, but again, I wanted to find out who the coal dealer was because even though there's a sign on it, I can't read it because it's a copy of a copy of a copy. And again, I wish I could find something better, but that to me is the only known photo that resides at the Historic Society here. So I thought you'd be interested in that. You had a good coal dealer here. Yes? Um, th now, you said that it was on uh, Pomegusset Road, but yeah. this was actually on Miles Road, wasn't it? Is it Miles at this point? Yes, Miles. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Palmer Gus Gusset is up above <laughs> on the back you, side. I want you to know that E.D. Mashoil carried that philosophy through the whole time that they were in business. <laughs> yeah. And they never refused anybody. And the reason Rutland stayed open as long as it did is because they were bringing coal and everything up to E.D. Marsh Coal here. And, but once the hurricane made all these washouts at Coldbrook and other places, no longer could he get his coal delivered by train because that was the most economical.
Here's another picture of the station. And I want to read a story behind this here. Notice that telegraph pole in the photo. So remember on the typical pole, there are 80 uh, insulators and usually one at top dead center and sometimes there's some off to the side. Now, why so many telegraph lines and cross arms to hold them all? Because this was a main trunk line. One of the things that the railroads did was they worked out agreements with the railroads that if they could run their telegraph lines down the right of way, they would give them some circuits so that they could use it to telegraph their train orders and things like that. And Western Union had their lines and things like that. So this was the main junction, if you will, because there's a whole bunch of poles paralleling the right of way that continue on. And there's others that are perpendicular to the right of way. So having counted them, I'm what's known sometimes as a rivet counter. As a designer by trade, I got to pay attention to details because when I come up with a design, it could cost my company thousands of dollars or more when I screw it up. So paying attention to details is important. So on this one, I already said there was about 80 glass insulators on the lines at the top here. But there's also another 50 down below. So I've counted over 110 glass insulators on the top and 50 because there's double arms over there. I don't know if you can see it. There's double arms, double arms, and these are all double arms. So I counted roughly 110 glass insulators and lines that crossed and that went down toward Worcester, I guess. Um, and in the picture, there's that stone milepost, and that resides in the front yard on Main Street at Ellen Junkins' house. And one of the station steins is also on the barn. There's a water tank. There's Route 56 way down over there. And there's a freight house. So when the hurricane came through in 1938, they had all the washouts. There was still a boxcar sitting up there. So what the railroad did is it inspected the line from Oakdale. They knew they couldn't go toward Colebrook and beyond. So they opened up the line and they, they, the bridges were safe enough. And what they did is they took out a tractor, I guess it was the town tractor, and they pushed this boxcar with a man or two on top to handle the handbrake. And it literally coasted all the way down to Oakdale. And that was the last train to run on this section of the line. And uh, uh, Rutland is at the top of the hill, from Oakdale being the lowest by the reservoir. And when it went down on the other side, it went down all the way to Quaburn, where the other reservoir was. So this was the high point. So once they got this thing moving, gravity did the rest, and they were able to make this thing travel all the way down to Oakdale. And you can see the train order boards are still in place, so the station's still open. Here is the flag stop signal at the end of the, of the uh, platform. So some of you might recognize this. It's Sharnak Hill Bridge, where today uh, we now have a nice tunnel that crosses underneath. And what's neat about this is I was working with one of the crews one year. We were cleaning this thing out. And wouldn't you know it, I picked a day when we come across this deer carcass that was in the sides. Aww. It was bad. <laughs> it was bad cleaning that thing out. But we found the approximate spot. And there's another photo, and I don't have it, that shows a section crew on the hand pump cart parked. And I was able to find exactly where the photographer stood to take this picture. And um, so we're able to walk through this today. And you can see. Way down over here, there's a little shed. And there was another one at the opposite end because during the winter, there was so much water coming off the top of the rock faces here that there was always a danger that these things would collapse and block the tracks. And you wouldn't want to have a train with passengers derailing down in here. And so during the winter time, there was you know one or two men at least that manned these things and they had to keep the tracks clear and make sure that there was no issue during the winter time. 
Another fun job. Now what you don't see is on the other oversight here is they always had access roads to be able to get to sections of the track to bring trucks. They had to haul down uh, a lot of supplies. And you can actually walk the whole top banking. I wouldn't recommend getting too close. On the opposite side, they're putting up houses all over there, so you really can't walk that anymore. There was somebody's property up there with a lot of nice old 52 and 55 Mercuries in the, rotting away in the, in the back, but I think those are all gone too. But you can walk that section. It's a nice little walk. So a lot of times when we come down the trail, we go up one end, come down, and then come back through the cut. And you'll notice that the photographer spelled it Shannox Ledge. So here's the two shanties. So there's the Sharnock Hill Bridge right there. Here's our little telltale. Here's one of the shacks. And here's the other one at the other end and just off to the side is a mile post that's out of sight. And that's the beginning of the cut right through here. What was nice is uh, when I was out there a couple of times, when they uh, tried to level the grade through the cut, they used uh, pneumatic drills, steam drills, I believe. And they had these drill bits that would drill down, they'd fill them with dynamite, light it off, and boom. And most of the fill was taken up and thrown off to the backside over here, or actually over here. So some of that hill is actually all the rock fill from what they blew out mm -hmm. through the cut. And I found one of the, quote, star drills. So they would load up this thing that had a little star at the bottom, and this thing would just go, boop, 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 and it would just slowly drill a hole down as it rotates. And then once they got deep enough, they'd load the thing up with dynamite, and then somebody had the wonderful job of pushing the plunger. And I've always wanted to do that. I don't know about you guys, but that always seemed fun in the movies. Anyway, so I found two star drills, actually three, but I found two of them. And, uh, and if they went into the hole and they hit something hard or didn't get down there right, they literally bent it. And that's usually how you find these things. If you find one, they're bent. So, and here's West Rutland. So today, the rail trail's off to the side here and literally follows this path. The foundation to the old station is still there, but there's nothing left of where the freight house was, but there is a little bottle dump over there. So you'll find all kinds of trash bottles back there. I think uh, people have picked the good stuff. So if you wanted to see whereabouts, because what you do, what did you do with your empty beer bottle or whiskey bottle or whatever? You just threw it down the banking. But most folks don't know there was actually three fatal wrecks, uh, train wrecks in Rutland. So another one happened in 1908. A train pulled up to the station here, heading toward Oakdale. And the conductor and one of the train men were in the back of the engine. And an engine coming up from uh, somewhere else along the line slammed right into the rear of the train and literally killed both men and started the fire where the stove tipped over and they were, quote, burned to a crisp is what the headlines read. And I actually have all those newspaper stories, so I won't go into too much detail. And a second one, um, they had a two trains in the yard here, and a brakeman was walking between the cars, and one of the cars that was being pushed uh, jumped the tracks, and he got caught between the two cars and was crushed to death. Not fun. Again, anybody who was making up trains had a very, very dangerous job. Did a, did a lot of the, the stations or the tracks, a lot of towns have crashes, you know, train wrecks? Uh, there were a few. Uh, Rutland had three and three and four, let me see, one, two, four fatalities, five fatalities, so. Was that a lot? Yeah. yeah. For one area? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I'm not familiar with too many else around here. Um, there was a train whose boiler exploded one time between Jefferson and Mushkapog, but luckily, uh, I guess the uh, fireman engineer got off in time and joined the birds before the boiler blew up. And sometimes when they blew up, I mean, they blew up. Uh, every, all the boilers have tubes running down them that water flows, I mean, hot air goes through and the boils and makes steam to drive the pistons. And you'll see the, all these tubes just like spaghetti all over the place. And a lot of times the boiler is blown in half, broken completely, the cab and everything where the engineer and fireman are long gone. And a lot of men uh, died because 
Mainly, either they let the water run out in the boiler because they weren't paying attention to the water glass. And in the early days, they had some very poor water glasses. And sometimes, we, there were maybe we was a clog of rust in the line there, and it would look like you had water in your sight glass, but lo and behold, you were running dry. And uh, explorer this happened. So they came up with their safety designs for those water glasses to prevent that from happening. You still had to pay attention, but um, there it was. Here's another picture of West Rutland. And again, it had a milk house. Here's the flag stop signal. Here's the train order signal. Coal bin, they all had coal bins. The West Rutland sign here and on the front and another on the other end. And here again is a train and this train is now heading uh, east toward Boston. And in railroad terms, east is always toward Boston. Doesn't matter where the compass is pointing, west is always away from Boston and there are exceptions, but primarily east is always toward Boston. And on the train order signal levers, you'd have inbound to Boston and there was a tag with O on it, outbound from Boston. And I told you which way to throw, which direction of travel you had to throw a lever. No. Yep. Can you describe where that station was? West Rutland State Park. Okay. When you come into the state park, you'll come to, uh, there's two ramps, that, uh, two paths that go up and there's a parking lot off to the left side. Whitehall Road. Okay. And we're going to see that. Lo and behold, this is where it was. So here's the path going into the park that led to the sanitarium. And the banking's over here today, and your path up to where the West Rutland Station would be a little further up the path, and you'll see the foundation still there. And you can see this one and only picture showing a train crossing over that bridge. And most of those field stones are scattered all over the place. There's a few on the trail itself, but none of them remain at the actual site. They're, all of this is gone. So it looked like there was a curve to go up through this little narrow passage. and So that gets you into West Rutland State Park. And we're always there as a family. It's always a nice place. So I think that's engine 1410. I'm not sure because it's certainly moving. But I'm going to guess Harold, with his camera one day, caught this as it was going by. In those early days, you know, the early cameras, when you're talking to all the way up to the 1920s, people didn't have the best cameras. It was pretty much just this throw a shutter and you hoped you got a decent shot. And then later on, you know, as cameras got more sophisticated, uh, a lot of photographers took a lot of photos that are nice, sharp, and clear. But the only ones that could compete with those later cameras were the gentlemen that had the glass slides. And the ones that I've gotten copies of, they're like eight by 10, the detail that you see in these photos is incredible. And we're at Colebrook Station. I guess I probably should end here tonight. Uh, that was a combination passenger and uh, freight. So you can see the new patching through the roof. So I know this is around 1908. The water tank is there. The footings are kind of missing, but there's an open hole at the bottom where you can see where the pipes once ran. And um, so you have a train here heading toward Oakdale, and it would pass through Rutland. You can see a horse and buggy. And a lot of these photos here, uh, especially in the building of the reservoir, you'll see a horse and buggy in a lot of the photos. Well, that's our photographer. He got out of his car, hauled his uh, tripod with his big camera and glass plates, found a spot, took a photo this way, turned around somewhere else, took a photo that way. and. Uh, so it could be, you know, that that's his horse and buggy, or maybe a passenger that got dropped off, because you can see a couple passengers waiting here, and that probably is a station agent right there. And you have a milk house again, sitting right here. So the farmers would drop it off on one end, I believe, and um, periodically when the train came by, they, I don't know if they ever threw ice on them, but the cars that they loaded them into would have some ice. And from the other end, they would load the milk cars to, again, travel all the way toward Boston. And that's basically it for today. I don't want to keep you any longer.
Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Questions? There's a marker for Colebrook Station, uh, right where the station used to be. Yeah. And it's about, uh, it's within 50 feet of the gate. You mean a milepost? There's a, a parking lot right there. Oh, the little placard. And yes. Probably within 50 feet of the gate, there's the marker, and you should see the solar hole. Yep. Yep, that's there today. And there's also a mile post just on the opposite side about 75 feet down that I'm supposed to paint one of these days. <laughs> but uh, You can still see the, uh, the square hole where that water tank was. Yes. Yeah, where they had the pipe that came down from the tank. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank I appreciate you so your time. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And thanks to Alice. Thank you.